Thank you. Uh, let me thank uh, Carlos and Ronaldo for inviting me here. Uh, I said before I've never actually spoken in such a beautiful backdrop before. <laughs> it's actually it's amazing. Um, so what I'm going to try to do in about 20 minutes is talk about uh, the U.S.-China relationship in cyberspace and give some description of how I see the Chinese see cybersecurity in cyberspace and what that might mean for the, for the rest of the world. Uh, and what I'm going to do is uh, kind of describe how the U.S. and China have uh, a lot of conflicting interests. Uh, and at the end, I'll try to talk about why Chinese behavior might change over time. Uh, describing where China stands in cyberspace and cybersecurity, I'm going to contrast it with what the U.S. says it wants. All right, so in 2011, the White House released its international strategy on cyberspace. And it said the United States has an interest in cyberspace that is uh, global, open, and secure. We can talk about if the U.S. has actually been doing that, but we can, that was our stated interest, global, open, and secure. And I would say that China only shares one of those interests, and it's actually not one, it's two halves. You put them together. So global, open, and secure. Open, we know that the Chinese have a much different conception uh, of the U.S. about the free flow of information. Uh, probably everyone here has heard about the Great Firewall of China, which is designed to keep information out uh, of side of China. Uh, the internet in China is actually more open than most people realize, right? Weibo and some other Chinese uh, servers actually manage to spread uh, information in ways that worry the government, although we're right now in the middle of a crackdown uh, on, on rumors and other types of things. So open clearly is one where the United States and China don't have the same conception of what cyberspace should be. Uh, secure is a half. Uh, and here is a problem of definitions. So U.S. policymakers tend to refer to cybersecurity, which is the defense of networks and routers and hardware and software. And the Chinese, like their Russian counterparts, will use the phrase information security. Information security refers both to cyber and to the, the concern about content, right? So again, the flow of information could threaten domestic stability, could threaten the legitimacy of the CCP. And so when you look at the international code of information security that the Chinese and Russians and Tajikistan and some other countries submitted to the United Nation, it, con it con uh, consists of this idea of information sovereignty. Right? Certain types of information are a threat to domestic stability. So that's one half on security. The other half is global. Right, so when the United States says global or interoperable, we mean these global standards, transparent standards, where uh, any company can compete in those uh, markets. When China hears global, they hear American. Right? They think we are talking about Windows or Microsoft or Oracle or other types of standards there. And the Chinese do not want to get stuck uh, being dependent upon the United States, Japan, Europe for technology standards. Right? It's a half because Chinese companies themselves, as they globalize, have a stake in global standards. Right? So what you see now Huawei, which is the Chinese telecom producer, which is incredibly controversial in the United States and Australia and the UK. But the language that Huawei uses right now is global standards. Right? We need to have open processes of safety and inspe security inspection. We need to have third parties. So they are now talking about the language of global, open, and interoperable. So there is a half there where the interest, but when you add them up, uh, you only have one shared concern. The United States um, has three major concerns of the types of hacking that the Chinese do. Uh, and quite honestly, the Chinese do it because they can, and so far there's been no costs, right? And the United States has basically seen three types of hacking. Uh, the first and the, and the most prominent is industrial espionage, uh, the theft of intellectual property, business plans, uh, and here there are a lot of very catchy phrases to describe it. People will say, you know, there are two types of companies, those who have been hacked and those who don't know it yet. Uh, and so the hackers seem to go after technology companies, petroleum companies, law companies, and other ones. How big the problem is and how important or damaging it is to the American economy is quite honestly unknown, uncertain. 
right? Uh, General Alexander, the head of the, the National Security Agency, the NSA, has said this is the greatest theft uh, uh, in human history. Uh, you know, McAfee used to say it was $1 trillion, but now McAfee came out with a report this year that said it was between $100 and $400 billion. If it's $100 billion and you look at the American economy as $14 trillion, then we're really looking at a, a very small amount, a rounding error. Uh, so this has been the main push uh, of the United States against uh, cyber espionage. The United States have, has consistently argued with China that, of course, everyone spies. Right? The United States spies, we conduct espionage, but the United States has consistently said we don't conduct espionage for economic reasons, to help our own companies uh, for competitiveness. You can see in the president's speech last week or two weeks ago, he reinforced this point. Of course, the Snowden revelations about Petrobras has made that a harder argument to make. The United States will still say, well, even if we were spying on Petrobras, it was for national security reasons. But that is a nuance that is very hard to make uh, and doesn't actually have a lot of uh, people that believe it, quite honestly, outside of the United States. The second type of hacking that the United States has seen from China is mainly political espionage or collecting of information uh, on thought leaders, on think tanks, on political leaders, people that could influence the debate on China. Right? So we saw the hacking of the New York Times, uh, Bloomberg reporters, uh, Tibetan activists. Uh, if you visit a pro-Tibet website, you are probably are going to get infected. Uh, I get spearfished about every two weeks, uh, probably from China. Um, so those have all been uh, major targets. And quite honestly, the Chinese both want to be able to know what kind of debates are happening in the United States, uh, and there's some intimidation going on, right? If you're a New York Times reporter and you're thinking about writing th about the wealth of Chinese leaders, uh, you have to be concerned about the safety of your contacts and, and do they know what you're doing. And then finally, the, the third type is clearly military. Um, part of it has been stealing US technology secrets, uh, the F-22, the stealth fighter jets, submarines, types of weapons that would be used in a conflict. But also the Chinese um, look at the US military and say uh, it is heavily net-centric, right? Heavily dependent on computers. Uh, it's more technologically advanced than, than China, and um, we, in an early conflict, perhaps over Taiwan or the South China Seas, we want to be able to reduce that advantage. So the, there's a lot of open source writing by Chinese military analysts about how do you take out command and control computers, how do you help hurt logistics, how do you do things like that. So that's all of the, what we see from, from China. Let me just say, before I get to the, what the US has been doing, is that even before the Snowden revelations, the Chinese saw a great deal of hypocrisy from the United States. Right? So as the Chinese will say, they are also the victims of cyber attacking, cyber attacks. The Chinese will say they are the biggest victims of cyber attacks. Um, the Chinese point to the United States and say, Oh, you were the first to militarize cyberspace by creating a cyber command. Um, you are spending more on the defense budget. You are the ones behind Stuxnet. Um, you are using cybersecurity as an economic uh, weapon against Huawei and other companies. So even before Snowden, really, the Chinese were extremely skeptical uh, of US positions. And of course, after Snowden, uh, it is even more so. They basically said, of course, we told you so. The biggest uh, threat to the free and open internet is the United States. The, 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 what do they call it? They called us the evil hacking empire. Um, so <laughs> that has um, kind of changed the tone. And also there's been a drumbeat in the press over the last year about Cisco and IBM and all the other American companies that have back doors or, or allegedly have back doors. The Chinese saying, you know, we've been saying this for a long time, we can't rely uh, on the West. Uh, so what the U.S. has been doing is uh, essentially uh, three things. And, and the first one is, the Chinese are right, it was, was Cyber Command. 
Right? Cyber, Cyber Command was created uh, in many ways to send the message that cybersecurity is a national security problem. Right? And the way that the United States deals with many national security problems, if not most national security problems, is to push them away from America, from the, from the homeland, to push them out. Right? So just like terrorism, it became something that we fight in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places. Cyber Command, the idea was that you would fight cyber attacks out in other people's networks. You would, you know, until two weeks ago or three weeks ago, I would hear Defense Department officials say, you know, we're engaged in active defense. Uh, I never could really understand what active defense meant because they would say, well, we're going to stop attacks before they ever come to the United States. And you would ask them what that meant, and they would say, well, we would be on networks outside of US networks. You know, maybe we would have to cooperate with Germany about questions of sovereignty and listening and things like that. But if you believe the Snowden revelations, it's not that we were on you know, networks and routers in Europe. We were actually in the computers in China. Right? So that's what active defense is, is seeing attacks happen before they ever get to us. That's one of the major things we've done. The, the second is this was a massive diplomatic push uh, against China, uh, what we call naming and shaming. So what, it, what used to happen, if you remember back to the Google hacks in 2010, 2011, Google gets hacked and um, they say it's a sophisticated attack and the, the press would call you know, somebody in the US government and the US government would say, oh, it was a state-based attacker. And then the journalist would call me and I would say, it's China. Well, so now that, the journalists don't have to call me anymore. They just call the US government, and the US government says, it's China. The language of it's China has changed over time. So for the most part, the US government will say China-based attackers, right? So attackers in China. But we don't know, is it the government? Is it you know, patriotic hackers? Is it people doing it on their own? In one instance, the US government in a report said the, the People's Liberation Army and the Chinese government were behind it. But on the, almost all the time we say China-based hackers. And of course, the, the big momentum that was built up was the summit that happened between President Obama and President Xi in June of 2013, where President Obama raised the cybersecurity issue as the number one issue between the two parties. Uh, of course, the next day, Snowden arrived in Hong Kong, uh, and those discussions pretty much fell apart. The U.S. says it still raises the issue with China, but it's clear publicly it has just not um, happened that much publicly. And the number of attacks went down for about a month, and then they have gone back up again. Um, so we have really seen no change in the environment on cyber attacks there. Uh, and then finally, the last thing the United States has done has been push for this discussion about the rules of the road, right, or norms of behavior in cyberspace. Uh, and here we were trying to promote this discussion again, as I mentioned before, different types of espionage, right, so intellectual property rights should be one type of espionage versus another. Uh, but also at the UN and the group of government experts, trying to get uh, the laws of armed conflict applied to cyberspace um, and also understandings about states' responsibility. So in fact, the Chinese did sign the, uh, the, the report, uh, the GGE report in June, um, which the State Department has been trumpeting as a sign that the Chinese have accepted the laws of armed conflict uh, in cyberspace. But in fact, what the Chinese have been trumpeting has been state sovereignty, right? because the actual agreement from the group of government ex experts says the UN Charter applies to cyberspace. And the US has said, well, yes, of course, the UN Charter and the law of armed conflicts. And the Chinese have been saying the UN, Char the UN Charter and state sovereignty. And that's really what they've been, been stressing. So the nor and of course, the norms-based argument has been much harder to push after Snowden as well. Right? Uh, it's, again, it's hard for the United States to go talk about rules of the road, norms of behavior. Um, given the revelations. So let me uh, end with why Chinese behavior might change over time 
Um, but my heart's not really in it, so I'll end with what might come out about it. So right now, there's actually no reason for the Chinese to stop hacking. Right? There's, there's actually no cost, as far as we can tell. Right? There's no cost and a lot of benefits. But why Chinese behavior might change over time are for three reasons. The, the first is, uh, right now, the Chinese see the US as more vulnerable than they are. Right. Our economy is more internet dependent, and our military is more independent, uh, internet dependent. But over time, China will, both, will have more and more of those vulnerabilities. Um, and in fact, you can see in the Chinese press now lots of discussions about uh, SCADA security and PLC security and uh, critical infrastructure and how China really is very vulnerable on that side. So over time, you could imagine a kind of mutually assured disruption or destruction where we could kind of have a standoff like we did in the Cold War between two cyber types of attacks. The, the second is, and I have no evidence for this argument, but I make it anyways, is that uh, within China, there is a very big debate about how China should move up the value chain. Right. So one of the big motivators for the theft of intellectual property, as I mentioned, is, is that China doesn't want to depend on the West and on the US and Japan on technology. Right. China is factory to the world, but it doesn't want to remain that because it's polluting, it's energy intensive, um, and most of the value is caught by American companies. Right. All of our phones are made in China, our iPhones and everything else. But the Chinese producer makes a dollar fifty on each iPhone. You know, Apple gets all of the value. So the Chinese want to move up the value chain and become innovators themselves. So within China, there is a big debate about how do you do that. The policy in China has been very uh, mercantilist, techno-nationalist. You know, companies have to shift R&D. You have to transfer IPR. Uh, a lot of IPR theft. But there are a lot of people in China who think this is not good for China, right? If you really want to move up the value chain, you have to have greater openness, you have to have more competition, you have to have more transparency. So I assume, and again, I don't know if these people exist, but I assume that there are people in the Chinese government who say the hacking is not good for China, right? Just stealing all of the intellectual property doesn't help Chinese companies. Uh, and it's really not good for our most important economic relations with the United States and also with the EU. The Europeans, the Germans in particular, have raised the hacking issue over there. So that's the second reason maybe Chinese behavior will change over time. The, the third one is um, traditionally uh, China actually has not liked to be outside of accepted global norms. Right? If, you know, the, China was a revolutionary power in the Cultural Revolution, but since then it has actually been a uh, fairly status quo power. It's joined most international regimes, it's uh, embraced most of them, and so you could see over time that in fact if we did have some accepted norms of behavior in cyberspace, that China would slowly move. Uh, and here the example would be prolifer proliferation. Right, so in the 80s, when the United States would go to China and say, you know, selling uh, nuclear uh, weapons or nuclear uh, plants and missile parts to Pakistan and Iran isn't a good idea, the Chinese would say, you know, this is a Western conspiracy. You're just trying to keep these technologies out of the developing world's hands. Well, in about the 90s, the Chinese said, oh my God, Pakistan has a nuclear weapon and they're our neighbor, and we don't really trust them with these weapons, this isn't such a good thing for us. And so you saw this humongous shift in Chinese behavior on proliferation. From the US perspective, China still is not where we would like them to be on Iran in particular, but they're clearly much better than they ever were before. So you could again imagine with cyber that China would shift over time. But as I said, all of these things are long-term things. Right? And, the, and the benefits to China right now are so high that I don't see any shift uh, in the short term. So I don't like to end on that depressing note. So let me just end really quickly on what we could do together. Uh, and, and here it's actually mostly military. Because as I mentioned before, the Chinese have a lot of this writing about if you have a cyber attack on the US in the opening stages of a conflict, 
and at least the writings that we can see, open source, the Chinese seem to think that cyber attacks will work, that, that they'll be very effective, the US will be kind of knocked on its feet, um, that they'll be contained, right? There'll be no kind of spillover or unintended outcomes. But the problem is, is that we have no shared understanding with the Chinese about, the, about these laws, about these norms of behavior in cyber. So something that the United States considers an act of armed uh, force or an act of war, the Chinese might think is fine. Right? We may think that if you take out uh, the power grid at a, base in J a US base in Japan, we may say that as an act of force. The, U the Chinese may not. And so I think there's a real um, worry about misperception and miscalculation, especially if the two sides are already very tense uh, over a standoff, but to say two, two ships run into each other, right? We've already had the incident several years ago when a Chinese uh, fighter jet hit an American spy plane. So you can imagine another kind of incident where that happened, where the two sides are already escalating tension, cyber attacks start, and e both sides don't understand what's going on. Uh, about two years ago, I took part in a, a track two dialogue. So there were US government officials in the room and Chinese government officials in the room, but it was supposed to be between think tank people. And, and one of the things we did was a scenario, this like I described, a kind of cyber attacks from the United States on China, and what would the two sides do? Uh, and one of the first things the Chinese side said they would do was that they would use the hotline and call the United States, call the Defense Department and say, you know, there are cyber attacks coming. We see them coming from the United States. And everybody on the United States side said, what hotline? We don't have a hotline. So there is officially a hotline between the China and the United States, but you have to, it, you just can't pick it up, right? You have to schedule it two days in advance. 48 hours in advance to say we're going to use the hotline. And in previous crises, when we tried to use the hotline, the Chinese didn't pick up. They didn't answer the phone. So we said there, there is no hotline. So then the Chinese side kind of starts talking amongst themselves. And then they said, came back and said, no, we'll, we'll use the other hotline, the hotline that goes to the Department of Homeland Security. And then the people on the US side from the Department of Homeland Security said, what hotline? There's no hotline. So there's a real problem of communication. <laughs> so there are some very easy things that the US could do right now in China. They would be, for example, just a discussion about thresholds. Right? What do you think an attack is? What would it look like? How you might respond? And the other main thing to do is not necessarily a hotline, right? because that is a very kind of Cold War thing, but at least who are the people that should be talking to each other? Right? Who is the person of contact that would call each other? And uh, these things seem to be having started discussion. So there's some positive news on that front. So I'll, I'll stop there and take any questions. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Very nice. Uh, just uh, mention a point that I was curious about, which is um, the fact that within China, it is very likely that the control that they have through the Great Wall might not work. I mean, for example, that they could be able to transfer information and uh, that internally there are, there are some gaps. I was curious about that because the first time I heard about it, just wanna. So there's really, when you think about the Great Firewall, there's both outside and inside. So uh, for the stuff outside, it's fairly effective. But if you are a sophisticated college student, you, you can figure out how to get around it. If you want to visit the New York Times or Bloomberg, uh, if you're a business, you have a VPN. So most of those people can get around it. But for the average user, those things are blocked. And the, we've seen some ratcheting up of sophistication. So uh, the Chinese seem to be able to target VPNs in some cases. We've seen some kind of traffic. Uh, and also Tor. They also seem to be able to, to track Tor. Within China, what we saw, at least until about three months ago or six months ago, was that uh, internet um, discussions were fairly free on uh, what's called Weibo, right? Which is the Chinese equivalent of, kind of the equivalent of Twitter, but it's more like Twitter and Facebook put together. 
And what we would see in those instances was that most discussions um, would, would last um, anywhere from 48 to 96 hours. So uh, when the maglev train uh, derailed and, and then the government quickly tried to cover up uh, the causes, that spread very, very quickly. Um, what seems to have been targeted, uh, there was a very interesting study that was done a couple of weeks ago that mostly what the government targets is not um, anti-government rhetoric, right? If you say, I don't like the party or this government leader is corrupt, that will actually stay up fairly long. But if you try to organize, right, and say, we should all meet outside the government office, that gets quickly taken down. So it's very directed on collective action. What we've seen over the last three months is a very robust campaign against Weibo. So what happened, the big thing that happened was um, they had a, almost a kind of a cultural revolution style campaign against people that were called big Vs, people that had tens of millions of followers. And these people were basically paraded on TV and in a, a number of instances arrested and said, oh, I'm sorry, I spread some rumors. Um, and they also passed a law that said, if you uh, do something that's retweeted 5,000 times, or 500 times, then you can go to jail for three to five years, if it turns to be a rumor. And if you have 10 million followers, it's very easy for something to be retweeted for five years. So what we've seen actually is a huge drop off of Weibo. Everyone seems to be moving to um, WeChat. Right? So we, there's been a massive migration to WeChat. So now there's a big debate about, well, can you spread information as quickly and as uh, broadly on WeChat uh, as you could on Weibo? Because it's not public, right? It's just within your networks. Uh, I haven't, there's no numbers yet. Right now, some people in China tell me, yes, you can. That in fact there are some you know people that are nodes that can spread it very quickly. Other people have said no. Hi. So just uh, two quick questions. One about WeChat, as we are talking about WeChat. So this is a app that's been uh, released quite recently, in Brazil, and it's growing in numbers and on its but Brazilian users. So one thing, and Ronaldo even wrote about it in Folha de São Paulo recently, is the idea that if you're using WeChat, your data is going to be probably stored in China. And um, well, as, as we can see here, as we have a new proud Brazilian users of WeChat uh, uh, just around the corner. So the question is, uh, how people in U.S., for instance, uh, see WeChat, especially in this time in which there's this huge uh, fuzz about people leaving Facebook for online apps such as WeChat as an alternative, especially for younger people to resort to those apps. But at the same time, you're going to have your data treated in China, so is that a good idea or not? So that's going to be one, one question. And the second one, and we were discussing discussing that previously today, but at uh, the end of Obama's speech on the revision of the, of the, uh, wor the works of uh, NSA was a very strong statement saying that we're reviewing those rules from NSA, you wouldn't expect China or Russia to do the same to their own spy programs. So how do you see uh, China reacting to that and um, if what we could take out of this, those last lines of uh, Obama's recent speech. So that's it. Yeah, so on the first one, uh, I, I doubt that WeChat will do very well in the United States. I just, I think the hurdle for uh, any Chinese company in the telecommunications or software industry is going to be incredibly high. Um, I mean, uh, uh, Huawei is constantly, you know, but against this national security problem. Uh, I just think most Americans are, are not going to be comfortable using a Chinese company's you know, data uh, having stored. I mean, even I, 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 you know, I use Evernote. Uh, and Evernote moves some of its servers to China. And I got a little bit nervous about that <laughs> until they assured you know, everyone that don't worry that, you know, that servers in China are for Chinese users. And, but you know, it did make me a little bit nervous. 
Um, and you know, to be quite honestly, not only from an espionage point of view, but just also from a security perspective, I, I just don't think Chinese cloud providers are as good or, or as uh, on security as probably their other competitors. Um, you know, that the last line was clearly a dig at the Chinese and the Russians and an attempt to kind of push back at the Chinese who have been, you know, as I said, constantly trumpeting, we now know who the big enemy of the internet is, right? Uh, especially, we have to go back to President, uh, to Secretary Clinton's speeches, right? Secretary Clinton made those four, three internet freedom speeches um, and about how the U.S. was going to be the force for this internet. And the, at the time, the Chinese said, you know, you guys are holding up the, the banner of internet freedom, but this is really about pushing your own values on us and undermining us. Um, and this Snowden has been, you know, an um, unbelievable gift to them uh, where they can constantly say, you know, you guys are the big threat, right? And, you know, the, the, and the revelations just never stop, right? They just keep coming week after week after week. And so I think, the, you know, Obama, U.S. diplomats are probably, you know, very tired of meeting with their Chinese counterparts and having to sit, you know, it used to be us lecturing them. And now I'm sure, you know, 20 minutes of getting lectured to by the Chinese diplomats, and so they felt like they had to put something in there. But the Chinese, uh, I, you know, I, the response to the Chinese, they didn't respond to that line. They just responded to the, to the, to the whole thing about surveillance and basically just said, we don't believe you. Oh, hi. Uh, my question is re regarding the active defense response from the U.S. to the new Snowden China behavior. Wouldn't it be, uh, first of all, will it be just for surveillance or it will it be a counterattack measure from when they are going to be, you know, sur surveilled? And whether or not it will generate a harder response from China behavior to that, wouldn't they be more aggressive to that? That scares me a little bit, putting in this point. Uh, I mean, that's a, a great point, and I think one of the reasons why the two sides have to discuss what these thresholds are, because the line between preparing, in the, what the Defense Department calls preparing the battlefield, Right, but otherwise it would be called espionage. So if I'm in your computer, you know, I could think it's there just for spying. But to the defender, it may look like you're preparing a more uh, deadly or violent attack. So there's no, there's, I think you're right. I think the Chinese will see that and say, well, you're in our systems. We don't know why you're there. Uh, and the US has had the same problem, right? We saw there were Chinese hackers in companies that controlled uh, uh, pipelines, gas pipelines. We don't know if they were in them because they were stealing uh, secrets, industrial secrets, or if they were preparing for an attack. So I think there's a, a real problem. And I think, you know, active defense is, um, you know, the U.S. has also talked about preemption. Uh, Secretary Panetta made a speech about preempting an attack. I don't know how you preempt an attack in cyberspace, right? Unless you're already, again, in the other person's computer. Um, so I think there's a real uh, 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 chance for uh, escalation, unintended escalation. So, mm. so Adam, what do you see the role of Brazil is in this entire situation? Because recently at the Dubai meeting of ITU, there was this split between the US and then China and Russia. And Brazil at that time, uh, sided with China and Russia. So what do you think the role of Brazil is in this context? So, uh, so in June, the council did this task force report on US policy towards cyberspace. And we had a very large discussion on internet governance and the kind of fiasco that was Dubai and Wicked and you know, what the US needed to do. And to be quite honest, a lot of it was written with Brazil in mind. Uh, in the sense that the U.S. position of defending the status quo was n not the most helpful, right? It was not enough to just keep going around saying, you know, we helped create the system, this is the system that produced the internet, and we we're just going to continue to defend it. 
uh, and that we thought there were some genuine concerns about uh, access to the to the multi-stakeholder model, and that you know countries like Kenya and others had legitimate concerns about security and didn't know how to get them addressed. And the ITU was a natural partner, and it was not enough just to say no ITU, no ITU. Uh, we had to provide some other type of things, and so we talked about you know both a kind of more transparent and accessible multi-stakeholder model, uh, and then working with international partners. And I, I, I'd have to read the report. I think Brazil is mentioned as one of those possible ones. Um, because I think we had a sense that, uh, at least I, hopefully I did, that the, you know, Brazil's position at the wicket was complicated by who was doing the speaking and what the, what the goals were. And that, you know, especially as multi-ethnic democracies that the United States, Brazil, India, South Africa, Indonesia, we should have this kind of common space together. That was all very optimistic in June. <laughs> and so what, that one of the big assumptions uh, in the report was we were going to have these partners. Right? The, actually, the, the report was based on kind of uh, two big assumptions. One was that we were going to have international partners. And two, that the US government and the private sector were pushing in the same direction. Often we're speaking the same language. Those, both of those assumptions have been uh, severely hurt. So I, you know, I think um, I was at the embassy yesterday. Uh, and what I hear is, is that you know, working relations are still very good on a whole range of issues on s internet and cybersecurity. Uh, at the senior level, they're still very difficult. Um, so I suspect that will continue for a while. Um, but I also think, um, given the language that I've heard about what's coming out of the April conference, um, and what uh, Carlos was telling me earlier about the idea about Brazil and Germany uh, cooperating together, this is a good time for the United States to step back. Um, there are lots of other people who can argue about multi-stakeholder and global, open, and interoperable much better than, than, than we can right now, uh, which was actually one of the points of the report. The report was, one of the points of the report was we, we shouldn't be caring, we shouldn't be doing all of this. Right? There was a time for other people to make the argument. And you know, I think, for example, if you look at what um, Sweden and uh, the Netherlands have done on internet freedom, right? they're a, a better voice in many ways than the United States is, especially with China. Right? The United States, China, it just becomes a lot of lecturing back and forth. So uh, you know, in many ways, we'll have to see what happens and what comes out of the April conference. But uh, I think the US right now has a fairly positive attitude towards Brazil playing a more forward-leading role. And I just uh, I told, told both of you, you know, before that this afternoon, Secretary Kerry tweeted you know, how happy he was that the United States was co-hosting the Internet uh, Governance Conference with Brazil. Um, so I think that's a, that those are all positives there. What do you think about uh, United States and China position about Bitcoin? Do you think they? Nice <laughs> um, so I don't think the Chinese have, I don't think either of us have figured it out yet. To be quite honest, um, the Chinese clearly are nervous about it. Uh, you know, they've just—they haven't outlawed it, right? They've just outlawed the bank trading it or, or taking it. Um, but I, you know, the, we're probably nervous about it for the same reasons. Um, and I was just actually at a panel a couple days ago about uh, the U.S. using financial instruments as a weapon of national security and national power. And so, of course, the current with concern with Bitcoin is traceability and terrorist networks and Silk Road and all those other things. So I, I quite honestly, I think the Chinese are going to have a very similar view, that they are going to be worried about um, both the national security impact on it and the control influence. Um, and the Chinese are going to be very worried about speculation. Right? The Chinese, because the Chinese stock market is highly speculative. Real estate is highly speculative. They're going to be worried about another thing that they can't control that's going to be up and down in the economy. Uh, before we wrap up, just a note on what you just said. Brazil is uh, the other country that has regulated Bitcoin. So I'm not sure if you knew about that, but Brazil has a law that 
uh, deals precisely with digital currencies. So it's a very interesting take. Yeah. It's a more liberal take than China, but it's, a, it's an interesting one. So uh, I would like to wrap up. Uh, we have a beautiful sunset uh, in the back. We have food, we have beer. Uh, so I would invite you to join us uh, to have some food and beer and see the sunset over there. And with that, I would like to thank Adam so much for being here and for a brilliant presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you.